to the studio at That Nerd Show. I'm Marcus Blake, and joined with me is uh, Julie Jones, and we are speaking with the filmmakers behind the 50th anniversary re-release of Deep Throat. So yes, uh, That Nerd Show fans, this is the first time that we're going to get to talk about an iconic porn film and its cultural impact. So I'm going to let the filmmakers introduce themselves uh, so I don't mispronounce everybody's name. And I'm going to start with you, Robin. My name is Robin Leonardi, and I am the sponsor liaison and coordinator for the Deep Throat at 50 World Tour. Okay. And you, Gerard? Uh, well, my name is Gerard Damiano Jr., and uh, my sister? Christar Damiano. And uh, we are the son and daughter of Gerard Damiano Sr., who um, wrote, produced, directed, edited uh, the original film, Deep Throat. Well, we definitely have some questions for you, because um, that's got to be a very interesting childhood. <laughs> but uh, I want to I start with this. Um, I feel like this is much more than just a simple porn film. It kind of started what the adult industry would become. And some of the discussions that we've had over the years, I think it also pushed the envelope about what would be acceptable nudity in mainstream filmmaking um, and determining rating systems and where we are now 50 years later. So, um, yeah, just there's a lot kind of happening with this. Um, and I didn't even realize it was the 50th anniversary. I, I was telling Julie, it's like, has that been 50 years? Wow. It doesn't feel like 50 years. No, how like time flies. flies. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Why I how time flies when you're watching porn. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, so I want to start with this. Um, 4K restoration of this iconic film. Whose idea was it uh, for that? And how did that come about? Um, well, I'll have to take credit for that. But it's not like we just suddenly came up with the idea. Uh, my sister and I grew up um, with the shadow of deep throats you know, over us. We were there on the set um, back in 1972 when it was being filmed. Um, we were small children, but we were very much aware of our father's career um, as a filmmaker. And we were proud of him. And we were proud of that. The fact that he was an artist, he was right. very upfront about that. Um, we were often on the, the location or location scouting or on the set with him. But that's not to say we were we were ever exposed to hardcore pornography. I mean, when right. whenever they were shoot a sex scene, our mother would come and usher us off the set. That's when <laughs> our father called it the nitty gritty. OK, that's what we're going to film. It's time to film the nitty gritty. Okay, what, you're, but, what you're saying is the first time you got to see the finished product, you had to sneak it like every other adolescent boy. Uh, I, well, it's funny you should say that because that's, that's absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely how I saw it here in New York on this very street that I'm, I'm uh, on right now on 42nd street, there was a theater that um, the deep throat and devil and miss Jones played on a double bill around the clock, every hour on the hour for, you know, 20 years or more, you know, my whole childhood, the movie was always playing there. So I was probably 15 or so. I think the statute of limitations has run out. So it's safe to say you know, my best friend and I in Queens, we, we hopped the turnstile and we came into the city and, you know, went to the theater. And, you know, back in those days, I guess things were, you know, a bit different. The guy didn't even look up from his racing form. You know, he just said five dollars. And, you know, I reached up and put my money out, you know, <laughs> just put my money up there and and went wow. into uh, to see the movie um, because, you know, I, of course, was very curious. Um, having heard of it, heard about it, you know, our father was prosecuted for it. He was, you know, had to travel across America to appear in court. You know, he had been arrested. You know, this was, it was like a constant presence. So, of course, you know, all of that. And then to see an X-rated film, you know, it's like I had to, I had to go and see it. Um, <laughs> but when I did go and sit with my, my pal on 42nd Street, um, we were much more impressed with seeing our family car. You know, that blue <laughs> Cadillac Eldorado that Linda drives through the opening scene, that was our car. And so it was just so exciting to see it on the big screen like that. And, and uh, you know, and sure, the sex, but it was, again, a very personal thing because we remembered being in, in um, you know, Miami. And so there was the pool that we all played Hi. in and there was the hotel and there's all these things. So it was hard to just, you know, um, focus on the sex in the film um, you know, we, th there was just so much more, you know, 
to it personally for me. Right. Well, I mean, it, it's, it looks gorgeous in 4K. I, I, I hadn't seen the film in over 20 years. And, uh, you know, I th- we think we both rewatched it. And it was like, I mean, it did. It, it, so fantastic job uh, doing that. Um, uh, I mean, there is something nostalgic of watching old school porn with, you know, crackly film and stuff like that. Uh, so I think there were some thing, other things we noticed now that it was then it's in 4K, but. Well, thank you. Thank you for saying that because it was a long and painstaking process just to locate the elements to make this. From, yeah. You know, um, our father, you know, didn't see the $600 million profit of Deep Throat. He, you know, had very unscrupulous business partners. He got cut out of the deal very early on. And so was left with, with nothing. And so, right. you know, we, we felt that, you know, it's an important film. It needs to not only be preserved, but it should be preserved as our father had intend, intended right. for, us, for it to be seen. You know, there's been different versions out over the years and there's, you know, it was on VHS and on DVD. And, and over the years, the film has changed and changed and changed again. Um, when it first came out, um, it happened at a time where the laws were about um, pornography and what could be shown were changing. And right. there was a lot of gray area, which is why um, there were so many arrests and busts. And, you know, the film played for a few weeks and then the police came in the middle of the night and arrested the ticket taker and the popcorn, you know, the, the concession stand, you know, woman and, and uh, like that. And then, you know, it was back on the screen the next day because they didn't follow due process. And, you know, a couple of weeks later, you know, 50 uniformed officers came and surrounded the theater and they shut it down again. And, you know, that was due to the vagaries in the law. Right. Because, you know, who's to decide what is obscene? So there were laws against obscenity, but then you had to, to prove what is obscene and what isn't obscene. Well, so, you know, one of the things I kind of found interesting is, you know, this film comes out in 1972 and like a year later, one of Marlon Brando's most controversial films, Last Tango in Paris. And granted, I know that's a, you know, technically kind of a French film where the rules are very lax in France, as we, uh, you know, we all know. But does that film get shown in the U.S.? Does it happen if you don't have this impact of Deep Throat? Well, well, uh, Marcus, it's, it's good that you said that because at the time and as a kid growing up, I was very aware of, of um, Bernardo Bertolucci's Last Tango in Paris because our father's film, Deep Throat and Devil and Miss Jones and Last Tango in Paris were always talked about in the same conversation, right. in the same sentence, in the same headline, because this was part of what you know, was later called uh, porno chic or came to be called porno chic. Yeah. Um, and that was a, a term that was coined in the New York Times, actually in an interview with our father, talking about the phenomenon of Deep Throat. You know, it, it came out um, about six months after the film had premiered. And um, the, the, the journalist Ralph Blumenthal was trying to express, you know, what was happening where, you know, again, there was this, this um, you know, unprecedented mainstream crossover where where you know wasn't just the raincoat crowd but you know people were going on dates and couples were going and it was making you know incredible amount of money and at the same time um hollywood started to take notice and the idea of porno chic was was this idea that these um you know what were just stag films you know before were now getting better and better with you know more production value and you know more sophisticated scripts and and um yeah and so forth where at the same time you know hollywood which had been you know historically very prudish you know was um decided that they better get in on the act because um you know, it happened at a time where the studio system was failing. You know, they were making these big budget movies that, and people weren't going to see them. And yet you had these smaller indie films like Deep Throat or like, you know, Mean Streets, where now you had independent right. filmmakers that were making their own movies and they were becoming these huge hits. And so um, Hollywood uh, started to take notice and they started to, you know, loosen up their moral code a little bit and try to, you know, approach what was happening in the adult films. Um, of course, uh, Last Tango in Paris and Bertolucci in Europe, people are, are you know, a, a lot more open-minded about sex and yeah. sexuality. So it wasn't as big of a leap, but right. um, 
but the porno chic aspect was having, you know, an absolute A-list actor such as Marlon Brando, who was, you know, fresh yeah. off of The Godfather, you know, now be in an X-rated film and yeah. perform, you know, controversial scenes, you know, that were, you know, was it simulated, what it was not, you know, there's a lot of articles about what really happened and how did it happen and... I think and I I think we all know Marlon Brando as a method actor. I think we can all guess that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm going. <laughs> he wasn't exactly a priest. Yeah. <laughs> no. no. You know, another film that I, I, I think of too that came out, I guess, a few years later, uh, one in Hel one of Helen Mirren's first, Caligula. Would that mm -hmm. film have ever been able to get made and be able to do a film that takes of that story? And I'm like, no. <laughs> Well, even now, when you see something like 365 mm -hmm. days on Netflix, and that is borderline pornographic, and oh, to mm -hmm. see something like mm -hmm. that, um, in my mind, I see that, and I'm like, how can women enjoy this and then go and nix porn for their husbands? And right. it's probably the same thing. I actually had this conversation earlier today with somebody who was like, oh, dirty books isn't the same as porn. And I said, it's exactly the same as porn. And she said, well, the sto there's stories in these books. And I said, <laughs> if you obviously haven't seen some of the older porn films yeah. like <laughs> Teaching Teresa or like Deep Throat, you know, exactly. that were such innovators and had these maybe not amazing storylines by today's standards, but they were definitely developed and in right. depth. And when you go back and you look at some of the older stuff oh, yes. oh, that yes. we don't know about because they were yeah. shunned and because of the negative connotation to sex these days, it really makes you kind of take a step back and say, you know, porn isn't the negative garbage thing that we want right. to make it out to be. Um, it's just the fact that back then people were so much more conservative about sex and its public place in society. Um, and I, I only, I can only smile when I think what your father would think now, you know, seeing like Pornhub and like all of these different websites, you know, and just the availability of porn and how much more sex positive we are these days. I mean, what do you think that he would say to that? Well, you know, honestly, I think, I'm sorry that he, he's not here to answer that question for yeah. you because he would have a lot to say, but, you know, I'm we sure. were all very close and I'm sure that I could, I could venture a guess. Okay. And I think that, that he would, he would comment on, on first off the, you know, kind of dichotomy and the hypocrisy of what's happening right yeah. now. I think he would definitely celebrate the idea of that there is, you know, kind of a new sexual freedom, things that, um, that he wouldn't have conceived of, you know, and, and I mean, this idea of gender fluidity, um, right. where in some of his early films, he featured transgender performers, and he was very ahead of his time in that respect, because he didn't draw a lot of attention to that. They were just, you know, people in the scene didn't matter what gender they were or weren't. It what didn't make a big deal about that. So I think he would he would see that in a very positive way, that that's very progressive. People opening their ideas about what their sexuality is and could be, you know, it's kind of being redefined and wide open. And I think that he would be, um, you know, very happy, and very proud of that. But at the same time, um, he made a comment, you know, almost 50 years ago in an interview um, where he was talking about the, the Supreme Court and Richard Nixon. And he, the whole thing that he said, you could literally cross out Nixon and write in Donald Trump. And it's the exact same thing. It's we're in the exact same place we were back then. And he was going on about how um, that the Supreme Court isn't really a, a court of law or justice. It's a political function. And yeah. it's stacked by people who have a political agenda. And this this was said at a time where Nixon had already, you know, been impeached and and left office. So even now, you know, that Trump is out, we're still going to have to suffer from the Supreme Court justices that have been put in place by again this, you know, political function that masquerades as, you know, as a court of law when really it's all about uh, political agenda. Mm -hmm. And well, so what you know, happens if you get repressed conservatives, but you yeah. know. <laughs> but that but that hasn't changed in 50 years. And I think you know he would definitely comment on on that as well. Now in terms of Pornhub and all that, you know, he would be quick to tell you that you know he didn't really set out to be a pornographer. 
he wanted to be a filmmaker. He was right. interested in making films. And he got into the industry at a time when that was really the entry level position, especially in New York City, where there wasn't a lot of, um, you know, there were no big studios that you could go and intern at. And there's not a lot of film schools unless you got into NYU and had the money to pay for it. Um, and so the, the way that you learned filmmaking was to PA for free sometimes on these indie films that were being made. And I say indie, back then they were called underground films. Indie didn't happen until, you know, Sunday. Okay, <laughs> now we have independent films. But before that, they were just underground films. And, and so he wanted to just make better and better films. And his early films were sexploitation films, exploitation films. And I don't want to say, you know, that it wasn't by choice. It was just really that there was a market for that and there was a need for that. And so yeah. he was able to make his early films that way. And by the time Deep Throat came out and then his uh, more critically uh, acclaimed films to come out later, like The Devil and Miss Jones or Memories Within, Miss Aggie, Story of Joanna. Now he was getting a lot of recognition as a filmmaker, but a maker of of what he would like to say, films with sex in them, mm. you know, not not sex films. That that leads us into an interesting question about, you know, we talk about Pornhub and in, in, in places like that about story. I didn't really remember the story of Deep Throat, and it's hard, you know, <laughs> if you watched it, I, and I admit, I mean, you know, the last time I watched this, I was what 22, 23. so you know, the, <laughs> the story is not as important except those iconic iconic shots mm. no no one intended on that one that was not a however however it is kind of a it, re-watching this there's kind of a funny and hilarious story uh, wrapped up in this i mean it's kind of goofy and uh comical in a way and you know when they're trying to explain that the clitoris is in the back of her throat and my favorite uh, but, part <laughs> yeah but it's also really romantical, you know? It's her yeah. quest to not fuck around and find a guy and settle down. Exactly. Yeah. Too. So, so there's that, you know? Well, you know, one of the, one of the things that I was commenting on, uh, too, was the music and mm -hmm. some of the sound effects. Um, I'm like, I don't remember the, ever hearing the sound of bubbles. <laughs> like, that's got, that's a strange sound effect. It, it, but it also puts some humor into the situation and, and stuff. And I, from a story standpoint, like I said, there's an underlining romantic uh, element to it. It's kind of hilarious. <laughs> I, I, you know, a little cheesy at times, but you still get these great iconic sex shots. Mm -hmm. um, so do you, in, in defining porn versus, you know, an erotic film, is the story, is that the story you put into it, is that what makes the difference? And I'll give you an example. I never considered shows like Red Shoe Diaries really porn, because they always had kind of an erotic story to it. And also David Duchovny made it sound sexy at narrating it. So. <laughs> But that's my question about that, because I don't know. If yeah, well, I, well I can, you know, if, if you don't mind, I don't want to mon Go monopolize ahead. this, ahead. but, you know, I'd, I'd like to speak on behalf of my father because I could, you know, give you a little insight into, you know, into his his methodology is that if you look at the, the film Deep Throat, I mean, you can pick apart the storyline and it is ridiculous and it was funny and it, you know, it was kind of um, very accessible to people, but from his perspective, the story is told through the sex. In other words, yeah. the sex in all of his films is never gratuitous. In other right. words, that it's it drives the story forward and also develops the characters with it. Where yeah. if you look at some, you know, it's like a common trope in slasher films where, you know, with by the first scene, you know, the woman is taking her top off. Now, you know, it doesn't really, you know, affect the story or, well, right. now we know it's that, oh, she's the one that gets gets killed first because, you know, that's, <laughs> right. you have to punish the slut, okay? These, are these, <laughs> these tropes that um, that we, we've come to expect, but we see a lot of gratuitous sex in films um, that really have nothing to do with the story itself. But our yeah. father's film, if you, could, if you look at Deep Throat, as ridiculous it is, as it is, or Devil and Miss Jones, as you know, serious and dark as it is, every sex scene develops the story further. And so yeah. he talk about that. 
Now, I can tell you as a filmmaker in my own right, you know, I started making films, you know, thinking I was going to follow in my father's footsteps. But, you know, I came in during the advent of video and shot on video features, one day wonders, as we called them, because right. you know, we would shoot two movies in a weekend, you know, regularly. And so when I, you know, started working on these films, it became very clear to me that sex you know, shooting sex, the sex scenes, those are cheap. And when I say cheap, cheap to shoot, you pay a couple of people to fuck and then you just roll tape on it. And, you know, it takes about 20 minutes and you got 20 minutes. You do that five right. times in a day and you got a movie. Okay. Right. That's what people were doing. Now, if you look at any story, whether it's, it's in a book or in film, it's the, it's the buildup that makes it erotic. You know, seeing the plumbing shot in and of itself, you know, what we used to call the plumbing shot or the anatomy shot, okay, you <laughs> know what I'm talking about, okay? That in and of itself, you know, is not erotic. And if you're on a porn set, you know, working 10 or 15 hour days, that's the last thing in the world you want to see. <laughs> but in any great literature and any great film where there's a love story, where there's a passionate connection between two people, yeah. everything else leading up to that, that is what builds the, the passion, builds that sexual tension and so forth. Now that stuff is expensive to shoot, okay? You wanna develop characters, you wanna shoot the what happened the day before or what happened you know, back in college and all of that stuff that, that leads up to the sex, that costs a lot of money. That's the production value. That, and also it takes, that's where you get into the writing of it. You don't have to write, oh, baby, oh, baby, oh, baby, okay? <laughs> but if you want to try to build up a story between two people and try to tell that in a cinematic way, that's where you get into the cost. So, you know, my father wasn't competing with Pornhub because, you know, the storyline is often removed from that completely, you know? But right. if you just want to see sex, why you be bothered with, uh, you know, if you look at a lot of the 80s stuff, especially a, a, a lot of the films that I was involved in and you know again i won't take responsibility for them i was just working on them but you know there would be, be these like crazy cockamamie stories that you know made made deep throat really look like literature i mean it was always this secret formula that you know made women horny or this you know <laughs> like that and and it was just so ridiculous that when you know later when um gonzo porn came out and that was basically the first reality porn that was so much hotter because now you were actually seeing real people that were getting turned on instead of terrible actors and terrible actresses that couldn't act. And even if they could, the two lines of, oh, I feel horny now that I drank <laughs> this lecture or, or I wore the amulet or whatever, you know, it, it, it like really is a turn off. But when you saw, you know, actual people that were turned on, you know, they, you didn't need to, um, to write a lot of dialogue for them, you know, their actual passion came across. And so that created a real boom in, in reality porn because, you know, again, it was refreshing, but then also cheap. You know, there yeah. was, a, it was, you know, Ed Powers and, and Jamie Gillis, I think, you know, uh, uh, claimed to have created it. And their idea was Jamie Gillis was a, you know, a famous porn star and they get a limousine and they drive around and they, you know, meet, pick women up off the street and offer them money right there on the spot and say, you want to, you know, come in and we'll pay you this money right here. And, you know, you be with this handsome and famous, you know, porn star or whatever. And then they would just film it right there. And yeah. so, you know, there was, there was, um, you know, a lot more interest in that in, than in, you know, somebody's, you know, two lines into the bed, we would call it because well, there, you was know, a lot of am there was a lot of amateur porn around that time, which actually my stepfather, Bobby Hollander is quite, credited with having discovered where a lot of people, once they had the advent of having a video camera in their right. own bedroom, they would start to film themselves. And there, that's where that passion was also, because these were real life couples. And this was really what they call, I don't know what gonzo porn is. And if it, if it in, entails, you know, being with a, with a male porn star, that, that's one thing, but this was like real amateur porn where, yeah. People were taking cameras into their own bedrooms. And that that spurred a whole other like kind of you know reality factor there. Yeah, so it, it it all happened at the same time. Now where the gonzo came in is that these were people that were 
already working in porn, so they had access to all this stuff and so forth. Right. But at the same time, people thought, well, I can just use my own video camera. And, you know, there was a lot of stuff that was being sold that was just, you know, people shot it at home, couples together, they would dupe them and put them in the bookstores and stuff. And again, because there was some reality in there, they yeah. weren't, you know, actors and actresses trying to, you know, look like they were turned on that, you know, it, it, created a whole genre you know and as as robin said there was a you know there was a, a real gold rush there because now suddenly you know you could do it even cheaper now you didn't even need the two lines into the bed you didn't need to sound you just you know had your home video camera and your, well, your making movies and you know i mean that's great for everybody that you know has a camera or a webcam nowadays and they want to do that and they can make some money i mean like you know I, i'm all about it you want to have an only fans account and do your thing that's great you know, and you, and this speaks to the First Amendment part, uh, you know, that deep throat spur, you know, argument spurred on. Mm -hmm. I also have a lot more respect as I've grown, as I've gotten older to, you know, what we affectionately refer to as Skinamax porn, the, the late night kind of dramatic shows that involved a lot of sex, you know, on Cinemax and things like that. It's like, at least, you know, you're throwing some kind of a story in there as ridiculous as it might be, or some kind of romantic element. And I think that comes from what you were talking about, you know, the writing and makes it a film with sex in it versus just a straight up porn film. You know, right. And I, I think Deep Throat kind of epitomized that because it, it, it was shot from the women's perspective and it was about yeah. women's empowerment and really what what the, the, the quest for satisfaction for female satisfaction. And that's something that you really didn't see in a lot of films uh, prior to this. And, and I think what it did was it encouraged a lot of women to express themselves and their needs. And then it kind of, once that video, you know, VCRs came into the home, that it created a whole genre of uh, yeah. at-home films that were made by women for women where yeah. they wanted to see the romance yeah. where you know my mother uh, uh wrote and produced several films that were intended strictly for women to be seen you know in in the in the woman's bedroom because before that woman had to go to Times square to a nasty dirty movie theater and sit next yeah. to a skanky guy in a raincoat <laughs> so really there was like this huge evolution uh that happened but it all started with deep throat Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, to comment on that, um, and it was something I didn't realize until I rewatched the film, but the, uh, the the other main character who's got the two guys coming out, like literally her first scene is a guy, you know, going down on her in the kitchen. And we still look at women like this. Oh, my God, you should be shameful. You're a slut. You're a whore and all the one. Why? She likes different kinds mm -hmm. of sex. Yeah. We all do. And why? I have found, especially over the last 10 or 15 years, you know, I'm not married. So, yeah, I've been on dating apps and everything. Talking about porn is a lot more acceptable. Like that conversation when you're meeting someone and trying to figure out if you're going to date, what kind of porn you like, you know, are you ashamed, are you ashamed to watch it? That kind of thing. And I always, and I always appreciate the people that are more honest about it because I was having that the other day with a woman. It's like, I'm not going to lie that I've watched porn. Now, I'll mm -hmm. tell you what it is. I am not ashamed about it at all. Exactly. And we well, just that's, that's what happened. You know, our, our society has created this stigma around it and we've made it bad. And why is it okay to watch a movie where somebody is getting decapitated on yeah. HBO? <laughs> yeah. But that and that's okay. You know, so there's this stigma and there's this hypocrisy that really casts a shadow on our own human sexuality and our ability to express ourselves that way. So I think it's really a conversation that we need to have now more than ever. Yeah. And I mean, granted, I still kind of think basic instinct is borderline porn with you know, <laughs> murderous <laughs> right with an ice pick, but no, <laughs> no but and, and going back and watching that film, you know, the sex scenes are not as compared to where we are now, they're not as intense, but it is actually, a, you know, an interesting story, you know, and I think, we, most people probably don't realize that or eyes wide shut, you know, when Kubrick mm -hmm. finally decided to make that kind of film with mm -hmm. all of the metaphors and, and stuff. And I, but again, I think that all goes back to those first films that come out of the gate as this is a film with sex in it. 
as goofy as the story might be. But um, I want to talk about, we don't have much time left, but I do want to talk about some of the First Amendment arguments and, you know, going before uh, the Supreme Court uh, with this. Um, all that your father had to endure, you talked about earlier that he had to go across the country and appear in court and didn't make any money. Um, was your father kind of proud to do that? Oh. Uh, did, did you have to make kind of take a stand for well, this is a First I, Amendment issue? Yeah, absolutely. Like I'm jumping in. I, you, you haven't even finished the question, but I can you know proudly say <laughs> but, that. But you know that, where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. No, our father... Um, very early in his career, before Deep Throat, as soon as he had a forum, he started to make statements about not only First Amendment rights, um, censorship, um, but also the hypocrisy um, in, in our culture. He uh -huh. grew up, you know, in a, 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 with, you know, he grew up as an only child with a single mother, but they were Catholic. And so he grew up with all the Catholic guilt. There's also Jewish guilt surrounding <laughs> sex and, and sexuality. If you're from New York, you get Jewish guilt just by association. And that's, oh. and that's a fact. And we got both, you know, my sister and I growing up. But, but not so much because our father rebelled against that. And so in his very early films, he made documentaries where he talked about this, where he questioned it. And then when he went, went to court over and over again, he used it as an opportunity to speak out, like in the courtroom. He would raise questions. He would, we'd, we'd get the, the uh, jury thinking about stuff. And he yeah. um, went on a college lecture tour. And I have a lot of his speeches and a lot of the things, you know, recordings of things that he said. And, you know, again, a lot of that is still very much uh, relevant today because it's the same fight. You know, he was talking about his films getting busted and, and um, you know, and other films at the time, Paper Moon was a very famous movie with yeah. Ryan O'Neill and his young daughter. And in the film, he, um, you know, she uses a lot of four letter words, okay? Yeah. And the film was, was banned allegedly because of that. But what yeah. really came out, and I don't know if you're familiar with this film, um, oh, but yeah. in the film that takes place in the 1920s, there's um, a, a very interesting friendship between the little girl, Addie, played by Tatum O'Neill, and a young black woman. And showing these two young girls, I mean, they were both, you know, kids, although the, you know, the, the black girl was a bit older, but showing them together and interacting the way they did in some places, that's what had people really upset. And that's why they banned the film. But they said, oh, because of the, you know, the, the curse words. Okay. But it was really, it was really something else. And when you start banning films or allowing somebody to control what you can and cannot see, you can't stop it. Like, where do you draw the line and who's to decide? Uh we you know, all know that in individual liberty only stops at you being able to own a gun. After that, there yeah. is. No <laughs> and I always, and I always love the irony um, about people preaching about individual liberty, freedom, freedom of choice, blah, blah, blah. Yes. For what you believe, but, right. you know, it. <laughs> exactly. but you want to legislate reproductive rights for a woman. And it, it, it's just the, the, the hypocrisy behind it. Okay, it has to be for the stuff that you find disgusting that you would never part, you know, be a part of and say, do whatever. And there's a lot of stuff out there like, I don't like your stuff, but go you for making it. Right. You know, my mother was a First Amendment activist and a free speech advocate. And she often said that, you know, the First Amendment was not designed to protect a popular forms of speech but yeah. uh, un unpopular yeah. forms of speech and that it, it exactly, you know, what the point to what you're, to what you're making. Yeah. Um, so this film is going back to theaters. Um, and I, I'm very curious. I, I'm, I was telling my sister who lives in New York about this and she was like, are you just watching porn? Cause I don't want to <laughs> like, no, Jennifer, it's, I swear to God, it's for research. Um, <laughs> That's what my husband was like, you're watching what? For <laughs> <laughs> um, but what, um, 
tell us a little bit about the re-release. I mean, you're starting off in New York, but this is going across the country too, right? Um, well, it's going across the country and around the world. I mean, we are adding new new dates. We're really doing a lot of this on our own. You know, Robin and I have been working for the past you know few months, um, and so it's you know it's it's a lot of work, but it's been a labor of love, and we've gotten a lot of enthusiasm. And so we're going to be taking this film um, from New York to uh, Bologna, Italy, where it will show at the Il Cinema Ritrovato Festival, which is a you know world festival of um, restored films, film restorations, and it attracts uh, film preservationists and archivists from all over the world. Uh, we're very proud to be showing our father's film there as um, a piece of film history. And they're very excited about bringing us out there um, because they felt that, um, that Deep Throat is, a, is part of history, but it's part of film history. And they right. even in Bologna had their own history with the film is when, you know, this um, festival is 35 years old. It was started by um, uh, Gianluca Farinelli, who um, runs the Cineteca Bologna. And he said years, many years ago when they were just starting, they had a little art house and they showed Deep Throat and there was a line around the block. And so <laughs> they, they wanted to acknowledge that. And so we're very proud to be going there. Um, we're going to be going to uh, Berlin. Um, we're showing the film in Seattle, Washington. We're going to um, uh, Montreal, uh, to mm -hmm. Cinema L'Amour, which is, um, is uh, allegedly the you know, most elegant uh, adult theater in the world. Um, we're very anxious to find out <laughs> if, that, <laughs> if that's true. But as far as we know, it's maybe the only adult theater in North America. I mean, we don't, can't think of a single one, not even in New York City, where you could yeah. actually go with it only shows adult films. Um, and so we're, you know, we've been invited to um, uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. We're excited to go there. We're going to be in Lisbon. Um, and so I invite everybody to visit our website, um, go to deepthroatfilm.com or damianofilms.com. And you can uh, see our, our world event, um, you know, schedule. Um, but we need to start here in our hometown and, uh, you know, tomorrow the world. Well, and I think it's also very important since your uh, father got screwed out of money, all the profits go to the family. We're going to recoup those expenses. Pro profits? You mean there's going to be profits? <laughs> <laughs> they, didn't tell me, they didn't tell me there was going to be profits. I, I never thought I would actually share this story in an interview, but I think it's uh, good. It's connected to Deep Throat, uh, but I think it's pretty relevant and a very good compliment to the film. Um, I bartended all through college. And I used to work at uh, a Bennigan's of all places a, uh, a long time ago. And there was I've an been to that one probably. <laughs> now, there was an older cocktail waitress. Uh, everybody loved her. I mean, she was the epitome of the definition of milk and had pretty much <laughs> everything. After hours, I don't know how she convinced one of the managers, but she, all the younger women, she taught a blowjob course. <laughs> <laughs> God bless her. Uh, right, all right, people were wondering why I wanted to close every night. <laughs> uh, was, was she taking volunteers from the yeah, audience? Uh, was like... <laughs> For sure, she but, got employee of the month. Yeah, yeah. Month. Yeah. She would always reference this film as proper technique and things that you could learn from, from this. And, at the time, I just thought it was kind of silly. And I think that was really the last time I saw it before re-watching it. And now that I think of it nearly 25 years later, I'm like, God, she is right about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened to her. and don't remember any of the waitresses that took the course or anything. I just remember <laughs> her using it as an educational tool. And she was right. So, uh, I want to ask, we won't go into how I know that, but anyway, uh, <laughs> so there is a question that we like to ask all of our filmmakers that's only unique to us. It's a very nerdy question. Uh, and here you go. If you could have a weapon of choice or a superpower to fight the forces of evil, what would you choose? I know it's the one question you're not prepared for. It's like <laughs> all the other answers. Now I got to think. And Robin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you. Oh God, can you repeat the question? If you can a have super, a weapon, if I can have a weapon and a superpower, fight the forces of evil. You can have more than okay. one. Okay. Uh, my to fight the four. Okay. 
Yes. My, now, you know, it, it's funny you say that. My mother had this poster for many years and it was kind of um, oh, like a Viking, you know, soldier and he had a dragon and he had his sword and the caption on the bottom said, slay ignorance. Nice. All right. I love that. And if I could do anything, I would, <laughs> I would, I would be that Viking with the sword. And my superpower would be to slay ignorance because really that's what keeps our country yeah. so incredibly backward um, is, you know, that the, just the lack of, of yeah, I, I, wonderment. I thought it was bad when I was in college and in high school on debate, arguing facts with people. And I can't believe where we are now. It's like are, just, alternate facts. We have, now we have alternate facts. <laughs> alternate <laughs> facts. A term. I, how do you even? That's not even a term. That's the biggest oxymoron. It's alternate facts. Like, yeah, it's well, in my world, we call it fiction, but sure. Yeah. Or lies. <laughs> it's an alternate word for lies. Oh, how about you two? Hmm. Well, the first thing that came to mind, I think, was like to be invisible. So when you're invisible, you can collect information and get like as much intel as you can and then, you know, right. pop up and use it, you know, at the right place at the right time. So that's kind of, you know, and then I've always wanted to fly. So I think I would put that in there somewhere, you know, like fly in, scoop up, get, you know, get the villain and save the day. That's always a great fun. answer. <laughs> And Gerard, last but not least. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I, I, I don't want to get too philosophical with this, but when you first asked that question, I started thinking on a tangent and, and Robin, you know, kind of spoke to part of that is that, you know, um, slaying ignorance, you know, because for me, I was thinking about, about compassion and the idea of this transformative compassion, because, you know, in today's world where we see so much violence and hatred and evil that is happening the the solution is not a bigger weapon like so you say yeah. what superpower oh, i want to be super strength so i can beat everybody up or laser vision so i can burn them or you know <laughs> no it's it's not that because if you really look at the root of the people that are, are are behind a lot of the violence that we see the senseless violence in america um, that happens almost on a daily basis. And also, you know, around the world, the wars, the, the, the motivation behind that. It's a lot of that stems from fear. People are afraid. Yeah. And, you know, the opposite of, of fear is actually hate. You know, like, like it gave me pause when somebody explained to me, you know, the opposite of, of hate is not love. The opposite of hate is actually fear because people are afraid and then they need to lash out. You know, they're trying to protect themselves. They're trying to, to, to do to the other before I, it happens I, to them. I, in, I think the phrase that you're looking for is fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate, Yoda. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I, we know. Hate leads we're, to the dark side. And exactly. we know. We're Star Wars fans. We and, know where and, you're yes. going with this. <laughs> no, of, of course. I mean, I was, I was 13, I think, when Star Wars first came out. So it was totally my demographic. And I, you know, I was blown away. And I dragged my dad and my mom and my sister. You got to see this movie. You, see this movie. <laughs> you know, who, who knew that, you know, like, like again, we're, it's not 50 years, but it's like, we're, what, 45 years 45 later. Years. Yeah. yeah, 45 years later, now it's like, you know, embedded in our culture where it's not even a movie. It's like a way of life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and to your point about like compassion, um, another thing I actually kind of get to share, a uh, couple of former staff members wanted to go cover the Adult Film Awards. And we're like, well, we can't really cover that because we can't mix that with Disney. Uh, it has to be in the right context. But I did end up interviewing Penny Pax uh, kind of by accident and found out how nerdy she really is and beautiful. And, you know, as she's got a whole line of, you know, products and stuff. And one of the things that I found interesting in talking with her is, you know, porn stars and how they kind of get labeled, you know, as these huge whores and they're bad people. And I'm like, they're not. They just have a profession where they screw on camera, make money doing it. <laughs> but they are loving and compassionate. They're nerds, they're, they have their own interests. They're singers and 
you know, some of them pop up in mainstream movies, you know. So, well, uh, you know, I'd like to, with a different job. I'd yeah. like to jump in and, and speak to that because, you know, having grown up in, in our household and, you know, Robin can speak to the same where, you know, her mother was a porn star. And a lot of her mother's friends who came around were all quote unquote porn stars. Now, first we have to say, there's no such thing as a porn actor or porn actress. You never hear that term. You make one porn movie and you're a porn star. That's it. It's like, <laughs> you know, there's no, in, there's no in between. You don't have to work your way up. You start at the bottom and then you're a porn star. <laughs> I never, people, never realized that, but yeah, that's very true. Well, when people talk about porn stars as if it's a thing, as if they're talking about giraffes and, you know, make yeah. a, 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 you know, a statement about that, you know, they're doing a disservice to everybody that's ever been in an adult film because yeah. they're all individual human beings that are all very different, that got into it for different reasons. Some of them, you know, are very sexually liberated and are using their agency and are empowered. You know, we have the Annie Sprinkles of the world and Nina Hartley and, and yeah. people that are, are better. And there, are, there are, are porn stars that have committed suicide, that were abused, that were forced into it, um, and everybody in between. And you can't just say, oh, they're porn stars, so they blah, 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 or that's a porn star, so she's going to blah, 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 because they're not all the same. It's not all one cookie cutter, you know? The right. only commonality is that these are people that were okay with having sex in yeah. public, having sex in front of a camera. Some people are voyeurs, and they get turned on by doing that. Some people need to pay their rent, and they do it, you know? And there's everybody in between. So, you know, we have to look at quote unquote porn stars as people. Yeah, it may, it may have been Mae West who actually said this or I'm getting it wrong, but somebody once said that a, promiscu a, pr a promiscuous person is not bad. They're just somebody who's getting more sex than you are. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say a little something, Marcus, that I think you'll like. Um, so my mother was, of course, Gloria Leonard. I'm not sure if you've heard of her. Oh, yeah. She, oh, yeah. Okay. So she, yes, you know, she, yes, I'm sure. So you know, she appeared in over 30 adult films and began her career at the age of 35 in 1975 when I was 12 years old. Um, she then went on to, of course, be publisher of High Society magazine. She was the first female publisher of a men's sophisticated title. She was like, you know, the Hugh Hefner of the 80s, um, yeah. uh, which I guess now is not a good thing to say. Uh, but uh, she, she was at an adult film awards one year and she had came up with a line and she was so funny. She was so witty and she's standing there. You know, there are all these protesters outside all these, right. you know, uh, Jesus freaks and, you know, carrying their signs. And she said in her brash New York, but oh, you know, she was a member of Mensa. She was brilliant. She was very eloquent, but also had a very sharp wit. So she says, you know, there's a lot of people out there that say what we do is indecent. And I say, if it's in long enough and deep enough, <laughs> then it's indecent. <laughs> Words to live by. Which is really probably something that Mae West would have said. <laughs> <laughs> I think my other one is is it mrs patrick campbell there's nothing wrong inside the bedroom is unless you take it out the street and frighten the horses <laughs> <laughs> so i think that's kind of synonymous with what your mother said but that's great i love that yeah that's it's in long enough and deep enough then it's in dc amen <laughs> well this has been a, an incredible interview again i never thought we would actually be talking about an iconic porn film uh and first amendment rights uh but again, congratulations on the restoration. It, you know, it is, it's a beautiful version of the film. Um, there's a lot that I personally didn't realize about it and kind of how funny it was and the story behind it. And I hope that more and more people will come to appreciate this 50 years later um, and get to Us see it. Us too. Us too. Yes. <laughs> so any last questions, Julie? No, I'm good. All I'd right. like to know how we can see this when it's all put together. Uh, we will have the interview up in the next uh, couple of weeks. It'll be on our website, uh, thatnerdshow.com. Uh, we'll feed it in our uh, cycle. But we'll also uh, send a, a link to uh, Annie, uh, and she can forward everything on to everybody. Great. Thank you. So, Thank uh, you. Well, we'll, probably, we'll probably include a write-up about the, the subject matter, a little bit of an editorial. Uh, since, again, I mean, we're nerds, but we... 
you know, again, we deal with First Amendment issues at the same time um, in our industry uh, and stuff. So, uh, and there isn't a nerd that probably hasn't seen this film at some point. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks to you both for, for allowing us this opportunity and for fighting the fight and keeping, you know, the First Amendment fires uh, stoked. And well, thank you all for your time. We appreciate you taking the time yeah. to talk to us. I was going to say, much. we need to tell you about our vote throat campaign that you need to include that to your nerds about uh, voting for deep throat. Oh, yes, our definitely. Um, well, okay, well, um, we, I know we're over time, but we need two more minutes and I can tell you. Yeah, hopefully I can do it in, in this is in very, one. very important. I'll do it in one. Every year, the National Film Registry selects 25 films to be accepted for preservation. And this is a function of the Library of Congress. Right. And um, these films are not selected by a panel. They're selected by U.S. citizens. And anyone is eligible to go online and nominate up to 50 films per year to be considered. Um, and the criteria are that these films have to be 10 years old or older and have some kind of cultural or historic significance. And um, according to their mission statement, these films should represent all aspects of filmmaking and not just big Hollywood blockbusters. So as far as we know, um, an adult film has never been accepted into the National Film Registry. And we feel that on the 50th anniversary of the oh, release yeah. of Deep Growth, that its cultural and, and uh, historic impact is undeniable. And so we're encouraging yeah. everyone to vote throat. So if you go to the National Film Registry, if you don't know how to find your way there, you can visit votethroat.org and that will take you to our page with a link for the nomination form. Vote for Deep Throat and then you can vote for 49 other films while you're there. Um, but uh, we feel that this is an important thing and we're encouraging everyone to uh, take action. Absolutely, that's really exciting. All right. Well, we'll we will get that out uh, absolutely, and I will be very disappointed if Last Tango in Paris is in the film registry and not this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you very much for interviewing with us. Um, Thanks, Mark.